Welcome to Stories de la Frontera. I'm Laura Castaneda. The spotlight was on the southwestern border this summer as ordinary citizens calling themselves Minutemen set up campsites about 50 miles east of San Diego. But along the way, they were met by protesters who watched their every move. The armed citizens say they're fed up with border crossers entering this country illegally. They vowed to keep them off U.S. soil. But one Mexican couple outsmarted them. And what happened next was a Minuteman's worst nightmare. One week old, Amara sleeps peacefully, snuggled in her little pink jumpsuit with matching hat and booties. But the infant's life didn't begin this way. Days earlier, the baby's mother, a 16-year-old girl from Mexico, lay for hours laboring in childbirth in the dirt on the Mexican side of the steel border fence. Her boyfriend at her side, her life and the couple's baby's life at risk was having her do the Lamaze breathing, uh, trying to calm her down, uh, but she was very, very distressed. She was uh, in a lot of pain. Yeah, but we can't take her out. Elva Salinas witnessed the incident. Salinas, taking part in an anti-Minutemen crusade along the border, happened to be camping nearby. When her group learned what was going on, they drove to the scene to help. Well, it was at least an hour before anybody did anything for her. It was really sad. It was a very sad situation, and uh, it was inhumane, I felt, very inhumane, to let a little girl, 16-year-old, in labor in the dirt, you know, and not do anything for her until somebody with some authority could make, a, make some kind of a decision. That decision falls in the hands of Homeland Security, the U.S. Border Patrol. Originally, the teenage mother told authorities she was a U.S. citizen from Texas, but she did not have identification to prove it. I just said, here, you take her then so she can get medical help. According to Jesse Diaz, another anti-Minutemen protester who was there, authorities insisted the girl be driven some 50 miles away to the nearest port of entry. As authorities debated among themselves on how to handle the emergency, Diaz reached over, scooped the girl up in his arms. I'm holding her. And the and the, the migra right here comes close right right up to me and he pushes me in the back and says, throw her back over, throw her back over. And I told him I wasn't gonna throw her over, that she needed medical attention, that she's a neighbor, they were gonna fine me five thousand dollars, and that they were gonna put me in prison, and that they were gonna give me they were gonna charge me with human smuggling. As time went by, the numbers of witnesses kept growing. Minutemen, anti-Minutemen, federal agents, and eventually paramedics. The girl's still screaming and yelling, right? It's just so intense here. The immigration's here, their hands are tied, they can't do nothing. Then they call in for a reinforcement for other par for uh, the ambulance. The ambulance comes and they come here and they still, the, the immigration wouldn't let them go on that side either, right? So they're all hanging over the fence here trying to assist this girl the best they can without going over. And then there's two biggest paramedics jumped over they got her, the stretcher was already here, and they just basically dropped it right into the stretcher. The teenage mother was driven to an American hospital, Grossmont Hospital here in La Mesa, where miraculously she gave birth to a healthy baby girl. But as soon as the shy 16-year-old was able, she called on relatives who then drove her and her infant girl right back to Mexico. In a stunning twist from a relative's home in Mexico, the baby's father reveals the emergency near the border that night was deliberately planned. There is no reason for her to be jumping the fence walking through the desert. We did it so she won't suffer so much. I told her, don't be afraid. They have to attend to you. They won't let you die. But Elias Lopez now admits he never expected authorities to take so long to help the young mother and her unborn child. I asked for the immigration officer's name. He told me no. I said, you know what? An official must give his name to anyone who requests it. That's your obligation. He responded, how do you know the law? Lopez estimates the drama lasted nearly three hours, but a Border Patrol spokesman denies that, saying their reports indicate it was one hour and five minutes from the time the first call came in to the time the girl was rushed off in an ambulance. The father also credits the anti-Minutemen protesters for putting pressure on authorities that night and wants to personally thank them. If they weren't there, we still would have done it. 
but thankfully, they were there. The teenage mom now admits she is not a U.S. citizen, but making sure her baby girl has that privilege, she says, was worth the risk. U.S. Border Patrol declined our request to be interviewed for this story. Officials call this a rare case. They say the young mother did not commit a crime, so agents did not detain her or escort her to the hospital. A 2002 study of border hospitals, by the way, estimates undocumented patients account for 25 percent of unpaid hospital emergency care in the United States, while uninsured Americans account for the other 75 percent. Well, she is one of the best-known figures in Tijuana, if not all of Mexico. Yet she is an American with a special title and a special mission. As Jody Hammond shows us, Mother Antonia has committed no crime, yet she lives in one of the most notorious prisons south of the border. La Mesa Penitentiary is not a place people live by choice, with the exception of one Catholic nun, who has had this address since 1978. I'm very happy here. I look up to see the guards on the wall, and I know my sons are very close to me. Her name is Madre Antonia, and her sons are the nearly 7,000 inmates at the prison. La Madre Antonia es parte de la historia del, del, de la penitenciaria la mesa. Warden Jose Francisco Jimenez Gomez says Madre Antonia is part of the prison's history. <laughs> and an important spiritual influence in helping maintain order inside prison wall. But Madre Antonia's history began in Los Angeles in the late 20s. Born Mary Clark, her grandparents were Irish immigrants. She grew up in Beverly Hills luxury. She married and raised seven children, but two marriages ended in divorce two strikes which, under normal circumstances, would have kept her from becoming a nun. It probably has contributed a great deal to my vocation because uh, it has allowed me to know what failure is, what disgrace is, what joy is, what pain is, what losing is, what winning is. Madre Antonia felt a calling to help others, a quest that brought her to Tijuana and La Mesa Penitentiary. I do think that um, uh, the doors open for me here that probably wouldn't have opened for me in the United States because I don't think San Quentin would really allow me to come in. But I don't know. I didn't go to San Quentin to ask, but I don't think so, much less to, to live there. Because she was too old to be accepted by traditional orders, then Sister Antonia received special dispensation from the Catholic bishops of San Diego and Tijuana to carry on her work inside prison walls. Her Friends of the Poor Charity raises tens of thousands of dollars from donors on both sides of the border each year to improve conditions for the inmates and to help their families. I feel happy with the Mexican people because they have been wonderful to me for so many years. I've loved them so dearly and appreciate them so much. Around the prison, she is known affectionately as La Mama. Her entrance into the prison yard well, L.E. helps me every day. And her unique brand of Spanish inspire smiles and greetings from the inmates. Her work even was recognized by Pope John Paul II during his visit to Mexico in 1990. She gives us a lot of hope. Jeffrey Kress of Los Angeles is serving an eight-month sentence for transporting undocumented immigrants. It's a blessing for everybody here. She gives a lot of hope, a lot of encouragement for the guys here that don't have any. She brings a, a positive element inside that uh, we don't have much of. Madre Antonia is very proud of the new prison chapel, designed by the warden. She's one of many clergy members who minister to the prisoners, but the only one who lives on the premises. Madre Antonia's quarters are Spartan, but she does have two cell phones, one for Tijuana and one for San Diego. Even though conditions at La Mesa Penitentiary have improved dramatically in recent years, it can still be a very dangerous place. Yet Madre Antonia says this is home. She feels safe here, and she's not planning on leaving anytime soon. Jody, I'm very comfortable here. 
I'm really very comfortable where I am. Soy Madre Antonia aquí, a sus órdenes. And in a house two blocks from the prison, Madre Antonia is bringing comfort to cancer patients. At Casa Campos de San Miguel, members of her order, the servants of the 11th hour, care for women recovering from chemotherapy. No, no, no tenemos que molestarla en ninguna forma. Like Madre Antonia, the sisters are women who were too old to enter traditional Catholic orders. Sister Olivia Fragoso of California has been a servant of the 11th hour for seven years. And I love what I do. I love people. I love what she's teaching us. I see so much of Christ within her work. The symbol of the order is a cross made of nails to signify suffering and Christ's crucifixion, with a star of David in the middle, representing the Old Testament. The nuns' crosses are made by La Mesa inmates. It's simple. It's only two nails. Through the years, some wardens have tried to limit Madre Antonia's role inside the prison. Francisco Jimenez is not one of them. For us, he says, she is a blessing. La Mama is under no illusions about the hardships that face her imprisoned flock. She is serving a life sentence at La Mesa by choice. I know that this is the world that we live in. We know that. And I can make it better. Mother Antonia's health has slowed down some of her activities, though her international schedule would tire a woman half her age. She will turn 79 this year, and next year marks her 28th anniversary living at La Mesa Penitentiary. Well, between the coasts of the Pacific and the hills of Ensenada lies one of Mexico's hidden treasures. For decades, El Valle de Guadalupe, or the Guadalupe Valley, has gained recognition as one of the country's most prominent vineyards. Sandra Dibble takes us to a one-of-a-kind extravagant wine celebration. Among these seemingly modest crops, a journey into the senses begins. Hovering beneath their colored leaves, these grapes are about to be transformed into a winemaker's pride, a connoisseur's inspiration, and a consumer's delight. For decades, El Valle de Guadalupe, or the Guadalupe Valley, has borne witness to this evolution. As a host to dozens of vineyards just east of Ensenada, the valley has quickly developed into the most prominent wine production site in Mexico. Set along the Tecate Ensenada Highway, the region boasts over 95% of Mexico's wine production. What's more, over the years, it has contributed to a rapid shift in Mexicans' interest in wine. Hans Backhoff's father founded Monte Chanique Winery in 1987. Mexico has been un, un país que ha ido creciendo en la cultura del vino. Eh, en esta región antes, eh, hace 10 años, existía alrededor de unas seis vinícolas únicamente. Ahorita ya existen más de 40 vinícolas. La gente mexicana empieza a poner un poquito más la cerveza a un lado y empieza a interesarse más por el vino. Here, grapes get personal treatment. They receive care experience stress, happiness, and fatigue. They embody many forms, and in essence, they exemplify true change. Mucha gente lo puede describir como un ser viviente. El vino eh, lo ves nacer, lo ves eh, desarrollarse, y lo ves morir también. Through this high-tech machinery, the grapes begin their transformation. Resembling a lab more than a traditional vineyard, the valley's crops go through a complete scientific process before being sent to their fate. With temperature tanks, pressure readers, and storage units, the evolution from fruit to wine begins its course. Nonetheless, even with high tanks and advanced machines, it is Mother Nature's touch which really makes the difference. El campo es lo más importante. Se puede decir que un 70 o un 60 por ciento, más o menos, viene el campo de, de importancia y después el resto, lo, lo, lo que sigue importante es allá en, en el lado enológico. For 
over 70 years, people from all over the world have traveled along winding roads, rocky paths, and steep hills to take part in this celebration known as the Vendimia. These festivities mark the peak of the summer harvest. As one of the most successful wineries in Mexico, every year El Cheto hosts this massive festival. The ceremony is marked by a traditional mass, a blessing of freshly gathered grapes, and then endless opportunities for wine tasting. The day-long party includes a traditional showcase of highly trained horses and bullfights before thousands of spectators. And throughout this rigorous battle between man and beast, music, applause, and chants never interrupt the constant consumption of wine. With over 2,000 annual attendees, tickets sell out quickly. Me gusta venir porque soy un consumidor de vino número uno, sí, y este vienes ves a muchas amistades, sí, este el ambiente es increíble, sí, la personalidad de todos, o sea es, es algo increíble. And every year, more and more Americans head south of the border to get a taste of Mexican hospitality and fine wine. When I was telling people I was coming here, I was amazed at the number of people that hadn't heard about the Guadalupe Valley. So it's an unknown co commodity in the United States. So how do these Mexican wines compare to their international counterparts? Wine is always wine. I mean, people drink it in joy and happiness. So I guess there's not much of a difference. The soil from the region plays an important part in this. It has a high salt consistency and it lies only 10 miles away from the Pacific Ocean, where it receives an ideal combination of sunlight and mist. Todo vino es diferente, o sea, si se produce en Francia, si se produce en México, se produce en Estados Unidos, Nueva Zelanda, Australia, todo vino va a tener características diferentes. Es un arte. El vino es todo un arte, es es un arte muy complejo que no te lo puedo describir así a simple Expression. Although to the naked eye they are simply grapes, to the hands that pick them and the minds that transform them, they represent a passion, a live art form that grows with the purpose of being savored, from soil to bottle and from a glass to lips of wine lovers all over the world. Wines from the Guadalupe Valley are exported to over 50 countries around the world. Well, it started out as a class project in film school, a short documentary inspired by the director's grandfather and Mexican revolutionary figure Pancho Villa. Director Omar de Leon now with Motor, a combination of a poem and animation telling the story of a haunted past. Amanecer es raro. Respiro fantasmas. Es el motor. Llegando al suelo, mis huesos se contradicen. Cayó mi caballo. Soñándome la vida vale nada para otros. Ahora va a ser diferente. Cada persona viviendo es cada persona que ha muerto. Ha 
A lo mejor fui otra persona completamente diferente. Yo soy culpable por tu muerte. ¿Dónde estoy? ¿Estoy solo? No soy inteligente, pero sí puedo ver tu sombra. La tierra se juntaba dentro de mis uñas. ¿Por qué te dejé morir? now is Omar de Leon, the director of Motor. Omar, how did you do this? This is a very unusual approach. Thank you, Laura. Well, I used a traditional form of animation called uh, cutout, and basically it's frame by frame uh, mimicking uh, puppet movement. Amazing, so. really different. Uh, recently, you were awarded Best Experimental from the San Diego Latino Film Festival. Congratulations for that, by the way. But Thank how do you. you get the word out? How do you get this in film festivals? Basically, you just let the film speak for itself and uh, People from New York saw the film at San Diego. They invited me out to the Latino Film Festival out on the East Coast. And then uh, from there, uh, just recently, I've been accepted to the uh, San Antonio Film Festival, which is happening in November. Congratulations. I have a feeling we're going to hear a lot more from you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it began as a cultural exchange between Spanish and English teachers and their students on both sides of the border. Over the years, the group has grown. Now the friends meet about three times a year. Recently, they collaborated their summer meeting with the California Coastal Commission's beach cleanup, all in an effort to pay respect to the environment. ¿Qué onda, Rodolfo? Hola. ¿Cómo estamos? Estamos. Estamos aquí sembrando. What I'll do is bring you some kelp. Okay. That soil amendment, I, if I had thought of it. Las actividades de este día, como la siembra de las semillas, Son un comienzo del labor colectivo y la amistad necesarios para mejorar el medio ambiente de la región. Con el empeño, unificación y entusiasmo de la gente de las dos culturas, las amistades y el contorno natural brotarán con el jardín de abajo y seguirán creciendo, desafiando la malla divisoria. Día de limpieza de las costas de California, 17 de septiembre de 2005. environment has no borders and so um, we wanted to show that by planting something that's going to grow on both sides. I want people on both sides of the fence to get to know each other, give each, give each other a chance um, and I think that'll put a more human face on, uh, on what's going on and the fact that there's plans to put in more fences and more barriers um, kind of literally and symbolically se separates us even more, segregates us even more. El propósito no es nada más recoger la basura, porque para eso existen las autoridades. La idea de la campaña es para educar a la gente, para concientizar a los jóvenes de que no hay que tirar la basura. You have to wonder who's throwing this garbage out off their boats or while they're here picnicking. It's really criminal, actually. So you get mixed feelings. You think like humanity is it's a mixed bag, right? There's this horrible element, but there's also this very positive element. Porque estamos tratando de participar todos en la limpieza de las playas y aquí precisamente en la línea internacional tenemos un jardín que se llama la esquina jardines de playas que le podemos decir la esquina de Latinoamérica. 
Entonces, como está aquí en esta esquina, quisiéramos que tener toda la ciudad y todo el país de limpio. They've been talking about putting up um, actually a triple fence along here parallel to this one um, that they can drive between. Um, one of the problems with that is that they're going to level some of these mesas over here that have endangered plants and um, they're going to take all that out. This park is Friendship Park. It was developed to foster the relationship between the people years ago and the monument talks about it and the fence will actually go around the park. So the park will be in between this parallel fence, which seems really ironic to me that you're going to have Friendship Park in between the border fence. Today, people from both sides of the border gather to improve the environment of their region, to symbolize their hard work, friendship, and unity across cultural and political barriers. They planted the seeds that will blossom into a garden and grow on both sides of the fence. California Coastal Cleanup Day, September 17, 2005. The organizer, Dan Watman, says he and a group of volunteers from Tijuana intend to water and nurture the freshly planted seeds for years to come. I'm Laura Castaneda. Gracias for watching Stories de la Frontera. For more information on these stories and more, visit our website at www.storiesdelafrontera.org. Until next time, hasta la próxima. Thank you.